Hello and welcome everyone joining us over Zoom and on Facebook Live. My name is Shubhanga Pandey. I'm the editor at Himal South Asian based in Colombo. And on behalf of the Himal team, I'm pleased to welcome you all um, to another edition of South Asian Conversation. Um, this is our series of online discussion where we bring interesting and important voices from across South Asia and beyond. And uh, in previous edition of the series, we've discussed issues like political economy of COVID-19 vaccination um, and uh, women political leaders in South Asia. You can find the recordings of these events on our website, himalmag.com. Today's South Asian conversation is on borders and borderlands in South Asia. And uh, the plan is to talk about how borders impact everyday lives, but also shape everyday politics in the region. Um, the question in the title of today's event, Who Needs Borders? Um, it's supposed to be playful, somewhat provocative, but also serious. And during today's conversation, we hope to critically revisit the ways in which South Asia's borders operate today, and perhaps to also reimagine alternative ways in which they might exist in the future. Uh, we have a wonderful panel of speakers who bring a variety of expertise and experience in today's discussion. Um, it will be moderated by Suchitra Vijayan, who is a writer, lawyer, and photographer, and the author of recently published Midnight's Borders, A People's History of Modern India. She is also the founder and executive director of the Polis Project, a research and journalism organization which produces in-depth knowledge on critical human rights and political issues. Before I hand it over to Suchitra, let me just mention that you can support Himal South Asian's independent cross-border work by becoming a member. You can do that by going to our website, himalmag.com. Um, along with a bunch of perks, you also get a, fame, a copy of our famous right side of map um, uh, delivered to your doorstep. So please do that. Over to you, Suchitra. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and thank you so much for putting together this wonderful panel, bringing scholars and writers and journalists from across the subcontinent and beyond, and curating the series. And that's very important. Um, this is the most I will speak, so I'll kind of frame the conversation, and then hopefully you'll listen to our brilliant panelists today. The questions of borders is not just a question for scholarship. It's not just a question of national security. And it's one of the reasons why these conversations matter so much is because so much of South Asia today is facing what one would see from far and what many of us living with these is an, an unprecedented rise of authoritarianism. Not that violence and authoritarian tendencies did not exist before in South Asia, but the ways in which this is manifesting in terms um, of what it means for our communities, what it means for institutions, but more importantly, what it means for those farthest away from power, I feel, becomes more and more relevant. We have some brilliant scholars, writers, and thinkers joining us today, uh, many of whose work has influenced my own work and continues to inspire many of them across the board. And what really connects all of these scholars and the endeavors to make sense of our social world, make critical interventions, and create important scholarship is their deep concerns for those on the margins, but also the communities that they work with. And they're asking important questions, some very direct, might be very relevant and very obvious up front, and some more nuanced and complicated. But eventually the questions that they ask are questions that are irrelevant to all of us. What does it mean for us to think about questions of freedom, dignity, rights? How do we think about resistance? Are there different innovative ways for us to think about resistance? But also what does all of this mean for the future? A future that becomes more and more dire, given that climate change will radically not only remake the borders and lives of South Asia, but also what it means for us to live in a very, very dystopian future that might always already be the present. Again, it's my it's um, it's my pleasure to introduce our brilliant panelists today. Um, in no order, I'm going to introduce all of them. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to start with Tamara Fernando. Tamara Fernando is an environment historian doing her doctorate at the University of Cambridge. She's currently writing a multi-sided history of curling in Indian Ocean focused on the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Manar. Uh, next, we have uh, Amishraj Mulmi. He's a writer and editor based in Kathmandu and the author of the recently published All Roads Lead North, Nepal's Turn to China. He's a columnist with the Kathmandu Post and he's also a consulting editor on the Writer Side Literary Agency. We have Madiha, next we have Madiha Kabir. She's a research fellow at the Center of Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University, a former journalist and filmmaker. Uh, Tahir's current research explores drone warfare, digital war, transnational militarism, and in the Afghanistan Pakistan borderlands. 
we have uh, Malvi Su, who's an environmental and social cultural anthropologist with research interest in India, Bangladesh, and Australia. She studies agrarian borderlands, cities, and environment, and is the author of recently published Jungle Passports, Fences, Mobility, Citizenship at Northeast India, uh, Northeast uh, India and the Bangladesh border. Uh, last but not the least, we have Manit Mani Dikshit. He is, of course, many would say he needs no introduction, but he's a writer, activist based in Kathmandu, and the founding editor of Himal South Asian. He also uh, works in areas of disability, public transport, archiving, architectural and environmental preservation. So that's the bio of all our impressive um, panelists today. So the way I'm going to structure this conversation is I'm going to put a general co uh, question to all of the panelists first, and this, and then kind of direct more direct questions at them, and also hopefully have all of their works also interact with each other. The question, first question I have for the entire panelists, and also a way for them to reflect on this question, but also to reflect on their own work, is. What do maps and cartographic representations mean to the people of South Asia today? And do certain groups relate to it differently than others? And also, I would be great if you guys could locate all of your works within this question. Uh, Tamara, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, and thank you again, Sister, for uh, moderating and Shubhang and the Himal team for bringing us together. So, my work specifically is on the Gulf of Mannar, which for those of you who don't know, is a body of water um, between South India and Sri Lanka or Ceylon much of the time that I study it. I guess the question of what maps do for communities, maybe one thing that is particularly pressing for my work is that if you were to look at a map of South India and Sri Lanka, even if you come to the place where the two countries seem to come closest together, that's Ram Setu, Adams Bridge, this chain of sort of limestone shoals that connects um, the two land masses. You see a very clear division between the land and the sea, right? So the school textbooks that we all studied, the shape of the island Ceylon or Sri Lanka is very clearly set off from India. And my work, which is mostly on fishing communities, um, coastal peoples who are divers, um, diving for chanks, pearls, sea cucumbers, fishing at the rest of, for the rest of the year. Really, this distinction between the island space as contained by the land and the sea doesn't apply. So the water is, you know, what some would call a sort of inland sea, right? So in my case, most of the fisheries that I study, and this is the pearling industry under British colonialism, so not really 2021. Um, but all of the fishermen coming to Ceylon are Indian fishermen, um, or they, they become known as Indian fishermen. So I guess maybe the first comment I would make about maps is that the way boundaries are drawn, in my case, between land and sea, aren't necessarily true to lived experience, right, or fishers who might follow um, fish stocks, other kinds of ecologies, environmental factors. So if we do want to trace sort of lived realities for communities, they don't necessarily obey the, the borders on the map as clearly, right? Uh, Malni, would you like to go next? Thank you. Thank you, Sachitra. And uh, thank you to Himal for organizing uh, this panel. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, from the Darug Nation in Australia, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and emergent. Uh, I'm going to answer your questions on cartography and maps with two, two very short stories, okay? One, Assam has fallen. We're in British India. Assam has fallen. But the zone that borders what we know today as the Garo Hills is still up there. Dense forests. The Garos are imagined by British colonial administrators as fierce headhunters, savages, who need to be civilized. But it's also the territory of Garo Hills that needs to be controlled, contained, mapped, and mobilized for resources, animals like elephants, forest produce, sea, and what have you. So then comes a series of British punitive expeditions into Garo territory. Alliances with Garos, struggles with Garos, raids, uh, efforts to bribe, and what have you. And then finally, the entire survey team that is led uh, by British 
uh, military generals and map makers. Finally, after battling forest fires, uh, haze from the fires, you know, Garo's misdirecting them, finally find a frontier outpost and convert what we know today as the town of Thura into the police station, right? And they, they, they place battalions of police force there and a map is produced. And this map, as uh, you know, the governor general at that time commented, was a big feat because it established British territorial authority over a huge territory that was until then obscure. But was the region settled? No, the region was never, never settled. Another map, fast forward to 21st century, Bangladeshi Garo Christian women from the plains and the foothills of Bangladesh are moving from Bangladesh to Meghalaya across a similar landscape, carrying export rejected goods. And they meet the Indian border guard, the Indian BSF. They're travelers without passports, right? Without visas, without any documentation. And the border guard says, look, grandmother, India is building a fence. You won't be able to travel anymore. And the women in turn tell, tell the border guards, they retort very humorously that we know forests, we know hidden streams, we know this terrain like the way you don't. And our maps are far stronger, our maps, our maps are eternal, and we have walked across these zones for years. So there are two, there are two map stories in, in these two stories. One is a story of you know, the art of cartography and the science of cartography that along with printing technologies came to colonize territories and colonize people. And in the case of the Garo Hills, actually conscript uh, Garos as indentured, indentured laborers to build frontier outposts, roads, and what have you. The other story is the kind of mental maps uh, that women textile traders with whom I traveled for a very long time operate with. And these maps are absolutely obscure, even to uh, you know the state agents who man the India-Bangladesh border. So I'm going to leave you with these two maps. One, a scientific discovery, and the other, mental map. Uh, Amish? Thank you, Suchitra. Thank you, Shubanga, for having us over. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, both Tamara and Malini have raised some very, very interesting points that also correlate to what I sort of like felt during my travels in the Himalayan borderlands while working on, let's say, this, this whole idea of how did this Himalayan border come to be? And I think the first sort of my reaction to your question would be that maps in South Asia represent a sort of a dis disruption, right? like a disruption to the traditional, let's say, movement that used to occur. I mean, South Asia is inevitably a, a cauldron. It's a, it's a melting pot of, that is made up of several migrations over the past, let's say, many, many years, right? So maps, in a way, represent that a disruption to the what was traditionally, let's say, a free space, like, uh, like uh, Malini mentioned, that, I mean, people travel despite borders being created, right? And you can also see an imperial hand in some way or the other in the way borders are drawn in South Asia. And with respect to Nepal, of course, like the, the southern, eastern and western borders were drawn by the British. But even the northern border, uh, the Himalayan border, it used to be a very, very, let's say, uh, ambiguous space of, of a frontier more than a border until China, until the PRC, when it came into Tibet and decided that, all right, we need to have, a, let's say, a fixed space you know, a fixed sort of a line that needs to be drawn across and on watershed principles, they have their own uh, things. But what that did was it just, in, it, it collapsed the entire Himalayan economy that used to sustain itself on, you know, trade from Tibet, going down to the lowlands, food grains used to go from the lowlands to the to Tibet. And this was across, across the Himalayan belt. And Alongside that, trade used to happen. Kathmandu's traders used to go to Lhasa. Uh, so this, this sort of disruption that maps have represented in South Asia, I think, to me, it, it comes from that. It comes from this, the center, uh, an imperial center wanting to establish its footprint to, to sort of reduce territory at, onto lines on a map, 
like that's the sense i get when i think about let's say maps in south asia and how people in the borderland sort of react to them uh mati hi thank you uh thank you to the team for him all south asian for having having me here uh for this discussion um so i work um with communities that are linked to the afghanistan pakistan border particularly the federally administered tribal areas or the region that was called that to 2019 when it was formally kind of merged into pakistan um under the constitution it is part of it was part of pakistan but it was juridically governed under a separate set of laws um and so most of my research actually happened prior to this merger and this is also the region where a lot of you know almost except for two or three drone attacks almost all of the drone attacks have occurred in the federally administered tribal areas um and so just to give you a sense of the geography before i talk a little bit about the maps uh, about the boundaries um the tribal areas have um an internal juridical boundary so there is the tribal area along the pakistan afghanistan border right and and alongside that is a strip called the frontier regions which are essentially a buffer zone between the tribal areas and the rest of pakistan so we have internal boundaries and then we have of course the border on the other side um with afghanistan um and what that has meant basically is that this area not only was it under a different legal regime it was also a different kind of infrastructural regime so in this region um you obviously we we have a very long history of colonial mapping we have the durand line that i think everybody knows about um but more recently um uh, with for instance a uh, post 911 what happened is that this area was maintained uh, actively maintained as a, as an undeveloped space right that's not something that just happens it's something that a state decides to do um and part of that was for instance so when i would travel to these regions um and i would try to kind of there were no there're no very good maps of the tribal areas that are publicly available and in fact there were times when the uh, segments of the pakistani government actually had to get maps from the americans or from the un uh to actually do their own work um and so when i would travel to these areas i would try to turn on my gps and it would stop functioning as i got closer to the zone so that place that area is um geofenced electronically geofenced so it makes it very difficult to map and so it becomes a kind of blank space in the imagination of people who are not from there or who don't travel to that region um it becomes very difficult to for instance initially what i had thought what i'd wanted to do was sort of to mark the checkpoints there are innumerable checkpoints along the way and blockades uh some of them building uh out of the old british checkposts but then additional things that have been built since then um but that became in, in not possible because gps didn't work and so what i had to do for my own mapping was to um actually literally have hand drawn maps when i would go which marked it by time because i couldn't there was no other really other way to do it so i and you know and so i have some maps that are just essentially mapping the time when i would hit a checkpoint and literally sometimes 30 seconds to a minute apart going from checkpoint to checkpoint um now with the un most recently the un uh is involved in a massive project in the tribal areas to map what is what is actually collectively held land there are uh, different kinds of ownership but there's you know not private property ownership in the sort of capitalist sense but part of the merger has been and part of the sort of um idea of progress in this region um by the state and by the UN is to map these lands in order to map the boundary lines of uh and to turn this into property so they're trying to figure out in a sense who owns which tract of land so that people can then um essentially get loans from the bank and use the land as collateral so in order to draw them into capital they're again mapping this region and attempting to map which i imagine is going to um the claim is that this mapping will help resolve 
property disputes, uh, various kinds of territorial disputes that exist among tribes and clans. But actually, it's very likely to, to throw up new, uh, new disputes because part of the uh, Part of the way that the fact that it is not written down, that it is oral, that it is negotiated actually also helps kind of keep a certain kind of um, peace uh, in, 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 in many ways. And so once you begin this mapping and once it begins, you know, being drawn into capital, it's going to throw up new kinds of disputes. I also found out um, as I, you know, when, when I would travel with folks um, to these regions, um, afterwards, I, you know, I would um, try to kind of go over a map with them to say where we had been. And people have, again, mental maps of where they are, but those mental maps are not commensurable to the kind of standard map representation. So people had a very hard time kind of understanding those kinds of things. And so then we would go through stories. We would say, okay, I went here, and then I would sort of map through it. But people aren't used to seeing even their own neighborhoods that they're utterly familiar with in those kinds of um, in those kinds of representations so um, yeah I mean I think uh, you know the cart the cartographic mapping both throws up it's a colonial thing but uh, but in recent years the the geofencing coupled with the fact that the Pakistani state has made it illegal for anybody for pu public mapping to happen um, legal mapping is really only supposed to be the, done by the Pakistani military. Um, and so that also uh, has undercut the potential for kinds of, you know, subversive kinds of maps or maps that could show the kind of um, militarization of the region by mapping the infrastructures of, of, of the military. Thank you, Madiha. Uh, Kanak? Yes, Richard, thank you. You asked uh, the question, what, does, what comes to one's mind when one looks at a map of South Asia? And I can tell you the first thing that comes to my mind is, and to my eyes, are the borders. Uh, and after you look at the borders, then your eyes goes to the capital and to the nation state. So a map, which I'll, if there's time, I'll come back to it later. There's no way to do without the borders for now. So what can we do with the borders that exist would be my thesis for the rest of the evening. However, for now, responding to your question, I look at a map and I see borders. I see borders, then I see the nation state. When I see the nation state, I look at the capital. And then I see the capital centric nation state, which means distress in the, what you would call the periphery, the borderland. Distress, for example, Malini talked about the most densely populated uh, borderland of South Asia, Bangladesh and India, which also would be the same kind of density, almost Nepal, uh, India. Then I see, uh, I see visas. And we uh, talk about visas that separate people. The borders would be sufferable if the visas were a regime were easy, but the borders become insufferable because we are actually steadily going in the other direction. Then I see the border fencing. Uh, I see the halogen lamps. I see the service tracks. Uh, and it is a cliche now, but you can flying over Pakistan into Kathmandu at night, you see the border because the Thar Desert is dark and you can actually see the border. And it looks like a beautiful uh, necklace, but it's a terrible sight to behold, truth be told. And so, then I remember the names. I remember Durand, Radcliffe, McMahon, even Palk of the Palk Strait was from, I believe, the governor of um, Madras presidency. So I remember all these names. And so uh, distressed by all of this, uh, in Himal, we, more than a decade ago, came up with the right side map just to be able to not look at the, the borders as we have been given. So if our friends at Himal, I just asked them in chat, if they could put it up briefly, I will get to my point right away. So here we are. This map uh, it also has the borders as we are given, but it upends them. And hence, 
people in Delhi tend to be rather distressed that they are found in the bottom of the page and that is somehow seen to be not uh, a nice place to be. But people of um, Matara in southern Sri Lanka are the happiest because they think to be on top of page is, is a fine thing to be. I think we must upend all these prejudgments and indeed try to focus on the people, which is what we try to do with this uh, map. You may take it down. Thank you. So this was map was also kind of a spoof of the National Geographic uh, by going in detail. It's not a, there you find a lot of ready-made maps where people look at different perspectives. But this one took three months by artist Subhas Rai, who upturned every city and every village where, where that counts to do this over three months. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one of the themes that has emerged uh, from all of our speakers and also my work is that, that people make their own maps. That the maps that people carry, the maps of genealogy, maps of belonging, maps of communities um, are very different than the maps that states make. The next theme that I want to go on and, and kind of put to all of the uh, panelists, um, very specific to your work, is also the stories and the scholarship that you do that often militates against the state histories that are already present and perhaps well, better known than the ones. Um, Tamara, in your case, you very specifically look at labor histories, especially of the pearl fishing and the ways in which these communities were severely affected by the colonial rule. Can you talk to us about how you look at this? I know this historically speaking, it's a very different time, but also how do you relate to these labor histories as a way of rethinking or reformulating the histories that are passed on to us as state narratives. Thank you, Sajita. Um, I mean, I, I was very struck when Madiha talked about attempts to map or to fix settlement following capital, um, because this is very, very similar in the colonial period. and. We can also think about, you know, what what it does today. But I I always think of my, my first trip um, out to Manar Island, which was meant to be a sort of ecology trip um, to photograph some wildlife birds that had arrived or something like this. And um, we were being taken by Navy boat. And the whole trip was sort of waylaid because they saw an, an Indian fishing vessel dynamiting um, in Sri Lankan waters. So then there was a big chase that ensured to um to chase the indian vessel out of um out of sri lankan waters and this is really not the story for the 19th century where i study um and in fact you know the demands of capital are often a reason to open the borders so if we think if we want to date citizenship to you know 1948 the decades after world war 2 even before that, so around 1906, the state has a system of passes and clearances. So if you are an Indian diver from Kilakkarai or Tutukudi and you want to go to Ceylon to work in the pearl fishery, you have to get um, a paper pass. You have to pass a medical exam um, to be sure that you're not bringing epidemic disease over to the island. Um, but... In times when the colonial state doesn't have enough fishermen to work the fisheries, they remove all the regulations. So it's a it's an open border for labor to travel, right? Or we can think, I mean, the, the sort of the most prominent example, at least in the Sri Lankan case, is the plantations. So we can think about, you know, hundreds and thousands of people migrating, uh, walking 150 miles to work the coffee and tea plantations in Sri Lanka, right? And then in 1948, the state suddenly decides to disenfranchise or to have a whole set of acts um, that essentially make 12% of the population, the Indian Tamil population, stateless, right? So Nehru says, we don't want these people in India. The Ceylon state essentially makes it impossible for them to get local citizenship. And then you have 12 years where this is an entirely stateless group, right? So the idea that from a labor history perspective or looking at where capital wants um, labor to be invested. And it, of course, it's also helpful, right? If the more precarious labor is, the less reliance that they have to legal frameworks, to political agitation. It also helps to keep wages low, to keep prices down, to make Ceylon tea marketable, uh, whatnot, right? 
So I think if if we were to look at a kind of long durée, say 200 year history of borders, at least the South India Sri Lanka borders, we can see that when the when there is this pressure from capital, then all of a sudden the borders can be open. Um, but it might equally serve as a pressure to to keep migrants vulnerable and precarious. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, Mali, again, the larger border question about how does one write these histories? But in your case, I think we've also had this longer conversation. The first time we spoke, uh, I read your um, your poem on border night. Now you have your book, Jungle Passports, that I'm actually reading. A beautifully done ethnographic work to a point where the writing very squarely does the work of placing these communities um, in cent- you know, front and center. Tell us about the struggles that you've had about not only the scholarship, but also what does it mean to write about these communities in a time when these communities are not only vilified and victimized, but there are also other processes, um, especially legal processes and processes in place that might strip many of them of citizenship. Uh, thanks, Suchitra, for your question. And also, uh, I would like to acknowledge Himal. I came back from the field in 2015, extremely exhausted. And I penned my first ethnographic poem, and everybody said, send it to a, a journal in the US. And of course, they rejected it. And Himal treaded where nobody would dare and published that in a special series um, on, on Bangladesh. Uh, so I'm immensely grateful. I've not just been uh, an admirer of Himal, but Himal takes risks when uh, scholarship doesn't, you know. So immensely grateful. And uh, coming back to your question, which which is such an important question, because, you know, I worked in a region that was partly fluid and open, and that was partly deeply territorial. Now, how did things become territorial and contested? Things became very territorial and contested when people started not just moving across the borders, but making claims to land as political territory. And this is how the movement of peasantry uh, since the 1840s, 1850s, from what were then, you know, the marshy provinces of Bengal that were getting flooded and inundated into the grazing reserves and the kind of wetlands of Assam. Started happening. Now, linguistically, although these farmers uh, could not be called Bengali in the strict sense, they were still Bengali in the Assamese imagination, right? And this taking over land as political territory became one of the most contentious, uh, you know, struggles between the British provinces of Assam and Bengal in in uh, in British India, followed by, you know. Uh, Assam and India on the one hand in post-colonial uh, Indian subcontinent. Again, after 1971, uh, it contributed to anxiety between Bangladesh and India, where people were struck until very recently in no man's land without food, water and shelter. And there was a lot of muscle flexing going on. And especially, as you know, Suchitra, and you've done a lot of work around this, Polis has done a lot of work around this, the CA and it's a disastrous effects have impacted uh, people of, uh, um, I would say, Bengali people of uh, Muslim origin uh, who reside in Assam. And uh, we have seen the repercussions in foreigners' tribunals. I have sat in two of these foreigners' tribunals in Assam, uh, you know, sitting and observing how, how people were being labeled as uh, either being labeled and given deportation certificates as illegal, uh, quote unquote, Bangladeshis, or they were being rebaptized as Indian citizens. This is one part of the story. The other part of the story happens along a borderland that was historically extremely contested between the Bengalis and the Tharos. But today it has morphed into a more fluid space where women, Bangladeshi Christian women, are actually. Garo women are actually moving to and fro across the border and they're doing it, one, because they're not of consequence to Bangladesh as a nation, and two, because in India, they they fall into the category of the, um, uh, the quote-unquote tribal, 
who's coming from Bangladesh, and because they're women, they will not cl- make claims to land as political territory. And land as political territory, the politics of language, you know, have shaped questions of citizenship and belonging in this region. Thank you, Mali. Uh, Amish, I'm also reading your book, and thank you so much for your book. Um, what I found fascinating was um, how much I learned from your book about failed coups, about gorillas running around. But you also had the tough task of writing about a region in which India dominates, where everything is about the Indian empire. What is every, every state becomes, every other nation state becomes in relationship to India. So when you were writing this book, you were writing a book about Nepal and its relationship to China, but also it's grounded in historical, in some ways you talk about a pivot. Talk to us about writing this book, but also the ways in which you had to very carefully write the story, because some of the stories that you tell in the book, again, militate against so much of what we regularly hear in the name of national security. Thanks, thanks, Sujita. I think, see, one of the one of the things that I was, uh, while I was writing the book, the whole research process, one of the things that I wanted to ensure was that, uh, as Kanaji said, that you know the way you see South Asia or the way you see the world, right? Like, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be fixated on a particular, let's say, pivot, right? And I would say that, yes, I haven't, I didn't, I was particular that I didn't want to bring in India in that sense. But more than India, I think it's about Delhi's history with Kathmandu. And I didn't want to particularly bring, go in. I have obviously brought it in because it, without that, the story would have been incomplete. But you can see that India is a big part of this entire, let's say, I mean, uh, I met uh, when I went to Humla and Limi, I met this person, he's, he's, he, ha- he runs a shop in China, in uh, Puran, right? But his kids studied in India, in the Tibetan run schools in India. So it's he goes to he goes to Dehradun, uh, they make these wooden bowls called Furu, and he goes to Dehradun to collect the maple bowls with which the uh, uh, bowls are made, and then he comes back to Kathmandu where he shapes them, then he takes them back to Humla and crosses the border into China and sells them there. So there is so India, or rather the territory of India, is an inescapable part or an inescapable reality. But when you're writing about, let's say, these stories, especially people of the periphery, right? Like people who are, let's say, largely ignored by the center. There is also this conscious voice, uh, this device that's going on in your mind saying, all right, can I tell this story by not locating it in relation with the center? No. Can I tell this story from the ground up, from the way they experience, or rather, as Tamar said, like their lived realities, you know? And sometimes and what I found was that these lived realities were sometimes much more fascinating than the usual, let's say, power between the capitals. You know? And you can see the implications of this, let's say, the center deciding life for people on the borderlands in many, many places in the, in the Himalayas as well. Like one great example is in Mustang, right? And Mustang, uh, the pass called Korula is one of the lowest passes in the Himalaya, about like uh, 4,600 meters. And because of security reasons, that's the pass where the Karmapa escaped Tibet in 1999. Because of that, China has created a border fence at 4,600 meters. That's like 22 kilometers long. And to my knowledge, at least, I mean, it on the Nepali, let's say Nepal, China, Himalayan borderlands, that's the only piece of land that's like fenced off, you know? And across, right across, like right where the fence, there is a gate. You can see there's a massive CCTV looking into Nepal. And these are things that, yes, it's a sense of shock and awe when you see it at that height. But it's also a sort of imagination of how, let's say, again, the, the power, right? The power center or the, the center looks at how the borders or how the peripheries need to be determined and controlled, right? Like it, that's in many ways what we've been talking about. That okay, can we impose some level of control on these borderlands in some way or the other? And with technology, with surveillance now, it's becoming more and more easier. And I suppose borders, once they are created, they will remain until 
a real, let's say, something drastic happens, they are here to stay. So the key question is, again, when you're thinking about these things, can you shift your, let's say, your vision or your lens away from where, let's say, it's been traditionally looked at from, where the traditional narrative being is created? Because again, like, I mean, with, uh, it's subcontinent, anything to do with China, South Asia and China, inevitably the India-China war comes into play, right? And everyone talks about that and everyone is looking at China from that lens or even the Tibetan relationship from that lens. But that was my argument that, okay, you, you, there is a historical relation that goes beyond just the center to center, let's say, uh, relationship. So I, I, I suppose that is where I came from while I was writing this. Uh, thank you, Mish. And like I said, I'm, I'm still I'm just still halfway through the book. But thank you for the book. Um, it's just I'm, I'm learning so much. Um, Madiha, for you, um, again, um, your work has informed so many of us about things, especially in these spaces. Um, if it's okay with you, I would like to quote uh, from the recent uh, essay you wrote for Boston Review. You say that in Pakistan, uh, again, uh, for those of you joining now, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Madiha's recent essay, that's excellent essay that's appeared in the Boston Review, where Madiha says, in Pakistan, the country of my birth, the country from which I became a refugee, the country to which I returned as a journalist and then a scholar, I've had friends, comrades, and colleagues forcefully disappeared, sometimes killed, particularly in regions I've covered, the tribal areas along the border with Afghanistan, that are being drone bombed today in the province of Baluchistan, where separatist movements are underway and the risk intensifies. Yet the essay also talks about the American empire. Your scholarship in some ways is a scathing indictment of not only what the Pakistani state does, but also linking that to the larger question of the American empire and how there has been a sense of a narrative amnesia, a myopia, sometimes willful misrepresentations and sometimes just a refusal to actually understand what the stories in the ground are. Can you talk to us about what it means for you to not write about these communities, but also write in a position where it becomes incredibly difficult? Um, I also know that Tanqid at one point in time, which was a flourishing place for rich cultural discussion, had to be shut down because of threats against all of you. Can you talk to us about that? Thank you, Suchitra. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think what I was trying to do and what I have been trying to do in my scholarship is that, um, as I tried to elucidate in the essay, is that I think for us in Pakistan, but not only in Pakistan, in other regions as well, we're fighting on more than one front. And so there is the question of what the Pakistani military is doing. Uh, and then there is the question of what is the, what the U.S. is doing. And I think what that has sometimes done in Pakistan, in the Pakistani context, is that there is um, there ends up being a division. So some people are talking about U.S. empire, other people are talking about the Pakistani military, and then the fighting starts happening, disagreements start happening about who is ultimately to blame. Um, and in addition, so that's one conversation. The other conversation that's happening is in the U.S. around drones. And even among, I think, leftists, there is... Um, an inability to kind of understand the networks that are involved in uh, drone bombardment. So that extend beyond the U.S. They extend into the Pakistani military and into the state. So I think part of what I was trying to do is bring those two conversations together and to try and start talking about the fact that these are not two separate in entities. Again, we are talking about borders and we tend to think of these as two separate states and then we say, which one do we blame? But it's better thought of as these complicated and uh, yes, racialized, but nevertheless collaborative networks that are actually working together to produce a kind of organized abandonment in the tribal areas um, and allow the drone attacks um, to, to, to happen. So that's kind of what I've been trying to do. And then in, 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 with Tenki, yes, we had, um, you know, one of our editors, Salman Heather was disappeared for a while, um, and we uh, had <laughs> we had many kinds of issues, and we decided to not go ahead with that, which is uh, to suspend publication for a while. And you know, the reason for that is that we really had to figure out a new new way of functioning because even though 
the so-called war on terror, apparently, you know, the U.S. is claiming that it's winding down. The fact of the matter is that it's taken on a life of its own in Pakistan and in other places where it's happened. And, and uh, the militaries and the security apparatus of various countries has sort of been using this discourse towards its own ends. Um, and, and so it's really kind of expanded in a way, and we don't really necessarily see it going away. Um, so, yeah, so, so, but just to sum up, I mean, I think what I've been trying to do is kind of move beyond a statist analysis to really get at, try and get at networks of transnational elites and security elites in particular um, that are creating these uh, so much devastation. Thank you, Maliha. Mr. Kanak, I do not know if you remember, many years ago, I met you after a talk in Colombia. I was about to begin my book project. And I asked you for advice. You were very kind. You gave me the time for about, I had questions about how to think about this book. And something that you said has always stuck with me. You very exasperately said, you know, anecdotes are everywhere. Everybody can tell the story, but what you need is an analysis. In some ways, I think that's what you've done with Himal South Asian. But we're also living in a time of, as we already discussed, and many of them have pointed out, um, there is a change in the, in the subcontinent. There's increasing authoritarianism. There is dis disinformation. There is a uh, curtailing of free press. So how does one now tell stories? Forget analysis or anecdotes. As someone who's done this for so long, how does one begin to tell stories? Forget critiquing even the state, but how does one tell stories in these dystopian times? Um, but also, how have you, have you seen a change in which you believe that there is the form of journalism or the form of storytelling itself has to change. I know it's, it's, it's a lot of the put on your plate, but I would really love to hear from you in terms of how you see all of this um, yeah. going forward. I'll start by saying that um, I would have hoped that the age of the internet would have broken the barriers that these borders created for us. And that by now we would be having a vibrant discourse uh, in many layers, across borders, uh, reviving the truncated linkages since 1947, 48, for so much of South Asia, and uh, pushing back the, the nation's statist, uh, exclusivist uh, uh, control of our minds. But it hasn't happened. Uh, it really hasn't happened, even though the, uh, the possibilities are there. This program, is one such which tries to break against uh, this kind of uh, nation statism that has taken control of our mind. So I would just uh, start, I would just say that it's never too late. So how can we use new technology, IT, online possibilities to reach out? Because for me, uh, to get people interested in stories, Suchita, uh, I would want people to be interested in stories across the border because that would have, if I do, if we don't count Nepal for a while for not having been what I call formally colonized and think of the rest of South Asia before 1947, a, a big fire in Karachi would have been news in Bombay. A bombing in Dhaka would have been news in Bangalore. But now this borders have become not only sharp, in the fencing, uh, once Himal did a cover story and did a special cover image analyzing the actual nature of the the Bangladesh, the India Bangladesh fencing, which is being put up by India, of course. How many layers? How many layers of concertina wires? And where is the service road? And how do they do it? And who is benefiting it, benefiting from it besides the Manufacturers, concertina wire and steel, steel structures. In beyond that, the, the fencing is actually now mines and it has taken incredibly, and this is not any kind of romanticism, it has taken only 70 years, as I see it from my perch here in Kathmandu and looking out across South Asia, only 70 years to divide people who are essentially of the same culture, civilization, what, whatever you may call it. You said that I told you not to start with anecdotes. 
not to get to Amazon. But I will let me give you one myself right here because this is an anecdote I must share. It is a documentary from 2007 by uh, Sarah Singh. The title is uh, The Sky Below. It's a fine documentary of an Indian documentary filmmaker going into Pakistan and follow and actually both sides of the border following the the what the partition left behind in the minds of people in the early 2000s and so she goes to the again the same kind of border fence on the other side on the western side of india and uh, finds that there is complete uh, demarcation in every way possible the sharpest demarcation of the borders in the world i think even donald trump wouldn't be able to do it with his wall uh, that is how rock solid this is on that in that stretch but then there is a dog which knows the feeding times across and uh, with the pakistani rangers and the border security whatever is the title name of the uh, border security people on the indian side so the dog is lovingly called tiger by the pakistani soldiers and raju by the indian soldiers and he can go back and forth we should all like to go back to that canine existence to be able to cross borders um but beyond that um to try and answer your question more directly things are actually more fraught than before things are uh social media which should have helped us move across borders with ease actually makes us more strident and more angry that is feeding into the ultra nation status populism that i believe has the politicians in its grip and that is why the politicians if they take any if they try to speak sense they are pilloried and pushed to the wall even more than a decade ago which is why i think things are more fought today uh to go back to what amish mulmi said look at the himalayan border the himalayan frontier rather the himalayan frontier was a soft frontier but uh it has become increasingly sharpened also because the paranoia of the indian state vis-a-vis the 1962 war but even now nepal india incredibly now there is a very highly charged uh border dispute between india and nepal in the region called limpia dhura and fast on its heels there is actually a dispute uh, apparently between nepal and china according to some um, observers on the nepali side so this is where we are right now suchitra we're actually in the worst of times and when do we start pulling back from that is the question uh, i feel i still do feel it should be possible to do something Uh, and that's probably why we are talking here wonderful i can already see a lot of questions coming in uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put one last question to the entire panel and once they respond we would start taking more questions and i'll also have follow ups um i found this question uh, very um it's it's a question that i found very difficult to answer for myself so i'm going to put it to all of you uh, the question is has the pandemic forced you to rethink ideas about borders <laughs> in a way in which they were policed um or as it remained in a certain perspective you already had um it's it's been a long uh, 18 months or a little longer than 18 months now and with pandemic now we have the pandemic passports we have other inequalities there's a global apartheid in terms of vaccines so this is a question for all of the panelists if you want to take it and then once we have it then we'll open it up for questions uh, tamara would you like to go first I know as a historian I'm putting you in a really difficult position the blasphemy of asking an historian to think about the future <laughs> no no not at all um I mean I I guess one sort of broader question that runs through the discussion is how do we understand what constitutes a border right are we talking about legal regimes sort of regimes of paper economic systems that cross borders military industrial infrastructures like madhi has work um you know i mean I, i think in some ways the pandemic in sri lanka you know we had such a deep reliance going back to your last or first south asia conversation at himal 
um, you know, we were entirely dependent on India and then China for uh, supplies of vaccines, right? Um, and if, if that sort of link didn't exist, if we didn't have sort of vaccines gifted um, or the option to buy vaccines, then it would have been devastating, right? So there are these ways that um, connections persist. But I also think, I mean, living in Colombo for some of the pandemic, I think at a kind of local micro level, right? So borders that are not the nation states bounds were also very pressing, right? I was, um, I don't know how many other countries had this system, but the government in, in Sri Lanka at least had this system of local lockdowns where they would lock in a neighborhood that was a hotspot. Um, so instead of saying all of Colombo is in lockdown, which also happens, um, they would pick a certain neighborhood and fence both sides. They would have military personnel. Nobody from the houses on that street would be allowed to leave, to go to work, to earn a daily wage. Um, and I was, I was really, really struck. Of course, this coincides, right, with socioeconomic disparities. So you essentially have, um, certain poorer neighborhoods that are just locked from the outside world and everybody else can drive their cars around and go about their business. Um, so maybe. I, I think for me, very viscerally, I kind of, I saw the city and sort of borders and boundaries within the city in a really, um, in a kind of very troubling way. Um, it's, it's a different kind of border to the one we've been talking about, but I was sort of very affected by it. Mani? So, Chitra, one of the things that became very apparent as soon as the images, you know, as far as India was concerned, as soon as the images of the migrant workers walking and dying in the process kind of proceeded, for me, the fault lines of religion, of Hindu as opposed to Muslim, became extremely apparent. So, in a sense, you know, last year was a partition, a border moment for me. It was the same kind of hope. Uh, that were being used nationally, that were being mobilized at the community level to demarcate two communities in absolutely irreconcilable and oppositional terms. So the religious fault, fault line was was very evident. But I've also been compelled uh, to think about internal borders sitting where I am in Australia, where uh, you know three cases means that the internal border shut down. And there are fences, imaginary fences that go up and you can't move from one state to another state within Australia. And uh, it's, it's extremely interesting to see the diverse ways in which uh, neighborhoods and you know, governmental areas which are being monitored as high security are, are being uh, policed. And uh, you know, it isn't the kind of, uh, you know, it's it's far more democratic than anything that I've seen in South Asia. But the intensity of lockdown has also meant that we have a greater divide between people with salaries and people struggling to make their ends meet. So I think Australia has also exposed me to a different kind of a bordering system. Uh, Amish? Uh, I think again, like I'm, uh, like like you, Suchitra, I haven't thought a lot about this, but and it's one thing that was apparent during the pandemic was that capital has the ability still to overcome any sort of border control. You know, I mean, if you had the sort of money, if you had money to spare, you could have traveled any way or the other, despite the. Uh, border controls that were happening during the pandemic, even inside the country, or let's say inter countries. Uh, I know people who basically, when the air routes to Nepal from Delhi were shut down, they flew down to Gorakhpur, they crossed the border, and then by land, and they can, again took a flight inside Nepal. So there were things like these happening. And the other thing that was obviously evident during the pandemic is that states can impose stricter border controls than we had thought. Uh, in the sense that, I mean, uh, to me, there are, there are some particular elements like 
the IC8140 hijack in 1999 that sort of like really sharpened or let's say made air travel between Delhi and Kathmandu much much stricter and then 9-11 obviously made air travel that much more stricter for across the world and suddenly you were faced with this reality that air travel was never going to be as convenient right and now post the pandemic now you understand that traveling the act of travel itself is full of let's say many many legislations many many let's say paperwork still and like you said vaccine apartheid right the fact that will will countries let's say in nepal we were getting the, the chinese vaccines right but will countries in the west then accept chinese vaccines as a let's say entry passport you know so things like that right so i think it has the pandemic does sort of make you feel that this whole idea of when you're talking about movement of people, movement, it's, it's the reality of it is very different than how it is portrayed to be. I mean, even within India, when you talk about migrant workers, as Malini said, you can those images that you see. And we know that in India, when times were good, migrants used to just travel, right? Like, I mean, you could see that, yes, like there were, you, I, I mean, I met Nepalese in Tamil Nadu, I met uh, Bengalis in Kerala and you could see that there was this sort of migration that was happening in regular times but suddenly this pandemic comes in and then you realize that all right it's going to get tougher to go from one state to another forget a country to another and I know people who were like struggling at the Nepal embassy in Delhi you know trying to figure out how do you get back how do you get back and someone I know pretty much took a train from uh, I believe Gujarat and uh, came all the way to the eastern corner of Nepal, then entered there, then stayed there in that border town for a week before he got the permission to, you know, travel to Kathmandu, things like that, right? And I think it's just, the pandemic has make, made us think about these things, you know, like, I mean, we talk about visas, we talk about all of these, in a very, very different way, in, in, in a much more restricted manner, in a way, again, that... I doubt it has happened in at least in my generation, like you know, like in my lived experience, it has never happened before. So, uh, thank you, Mish uh, Madhi. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a it's a it's a hard a hard question. I I would say I guess um, I guess I would make four brief points. One is, as I think others are saying, you know, I think the the pandemic has exposed the fact that. We are, you know, we like to think of ourselves as walled off, whether as individuals or as states, but I think the pandemic has really exposed the fact that we are interconnected and this is not something that we can resolve in a kind of state-centric way, which is partly why this pandemic is continuing, is because it pops up, you know, new strains of the virus pop up in different spaces and because there are inequalities essentially in the dispensation of the vaccine and care and all of these things um, we are unable to actually deal with the, the pandemic the second thing I would say is that you know I think one of the things that's been happening certainly in the United States is is that we are now being sort of the pandemic is sort of being normalized right it's it's you know, let's get back to work. And so while elites are kind of continuing to sort of wall themselves off, um, they're not the ones who necessarily need to, you know, show up and be exposed to, to multitudes of people. Workers are being asked to return to work um, in person uh, and expose themselves, kids in public schools, you know, um, teachers, uh, food delivery people, um, waiters, waitresses. So I think um, the pandemic is sort of exacerbating and really laying bare the kind of dystopic um, world that we that we live in, uh, <laughs> where our very lives are at stake, and yet, and yet we are being asked to return to work. The third thing I would say, you know, is in Pakistan, for instance, and for some of the folks that I've spoken with, uh, who have been who I've been in touch with for a while, you know, there's a, there's a, there's there's deep mistrust about whether the pandemic exists. Uh, there's deep mistrust about the statistics, there's deep mistrust about the vaccine. Um, and that, you know, in part has to do with um, the sort of history of, you know, the recent history, in fact, of, you know, the US using the polio uh, vaccine as a ruse to, for, to find Osama bin Laden. Has, I mean, that only 
added and exacerbated the kind of um, sense of deep mistrust. And so people really mistrust the vaccine and aren't, aren't willing to, you know, take it. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, because I work on the region and I work on drone warfare, I've been thinking about this and so don't hold me to it, <laughs> but it's just somewhat of an inarticulate thought, but I have been thinking about, you know, terrorism or many terrorism experts in the, uh, a lot of terrorism expertise centers around thinking of terrorism as epidemiological, thinking of it as a contagion, thinking of it as a kind of pandemic. Right. And so I've been thinking, you know, what is the similarity between things that get called a pandemic health wise and terrorism as a pandemic, uh, being conceptualized as a pandemic? Um, and it seems to me that it, it is the potential to of quote unquote random violence that is the potential to hit at the elites, whether that is the virus or whether that is the kinds of. Uh, spectacular attacks, bomb blasts, etc., that have the potential, at least, to attack elites. Um, be, you know, which is not to say that this isn't a pandemic, but it is to say that there are many kinds of slow violence or other kinds of massive deaths that happen in from mortality rates, famine, hunger. You know, the flooding of entire villages and towns in Pakistan due to climate change. None of which are, you know, thought of in terms of a pandemic, in terms of an emergency that needs to be kind of something needs to be done about because those are things that primarily affect, you know, the elites have contained it to a degree in a way that they primarily affect people who are poorer, who are more marginalized. Um, and so we don't see those things in the same kind of emergency uh, framework uh, that we do the virus or the kinds of things that we call terrorism. Thank you, Madhya. I think this You've said a lot, and I think there's much to go on that. Um, and hopefully we'll have more conversations about this um, in, 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 um, soon. Uh, Kana? Yeah, I, I think what I have to say also might uh, respond briefly to what Basil Andrews, uh, the question he has on chat. Um, you would have expected that the coronavirus epidemic would have brought down the barriers because the virus needed no visas. And so people would open up to the idea. Instead, the walls went up higher. Uh, and this looks like I'm just bewailing the fact, but uh, one, one understands the challenge is the only point when you can start thinking about what do we do about it. But just to, for the moment, to continue the, the bewailing, so to speak, People are increasingly requiring um, more stringent uh, border, cross-border requirements. Even the Nepal-India border, which is an open border. And if I have the time, I will talk at some length about that uh, if we have the time uh, this evening. But um, even the Nepal-India border also saw a, a kind of a challenges and rigidities and people coming back. Um, not being allowed into their own home country because they were coming in from parts of India where the virus was raging. So this was a whole new experience. Uh, also explaining, describing what I said earlier, the walls are getting higher. Whereas vectors do not need visas, cyclones do not need visas, the climate crisis and the rising oceans, the waters do not need visas. So yes, as uh, the question asked by Basil Andrews, this is would have been the time to think through the post-COVID uh, challenge uh, issues relating to borders in the post-COVID era. But I am sorry to say that if anything, we've become more rigid uh, at this point. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kanak. Um, I just came back from India when in early 2000, uh, 2020, just when the protests in India were happening, I came back and then the, the Delhi violence happened. And very soon um, we saw people that we knew um, not only assaulted um, and then the pandemic happens. And at least for me, I saw some of India's leading intellectuals, whether it's Dr. Anand Taltumde, many, many others. Um, so the BK6 uh, then became now the BK16, you saw 
people like Father San Swami, who recently passed away, who were arrested in the middle of the pandemic, not given the treatment. And in some ways, I felt that the pandemic had become um, a way to just create more juridical structures or even use existing systems to just become more cruel. The system has always been cruel um, and violent, but then the pandemic also became that. Also, I was in, uh, in New York. I'm still in New York, which was also the center of the pandemic. Again, you saw those who were... Um, New York is a very... Um, while the ownership of land is very white, it's still a very working city. Everybody in the city comes from the other boroughs. And again, you saw that it was the brown and black and the working communities that were disproportionately hit. Um, I'm still trying to make sense of this. And in some ways, just listening to all of you, um, um, it's, it's been, it's been, a, it's, it's been an, an interesting moment to also take some of this in. Um, at this moment, I'm going to do two things. Uh, I'm also going to acknowledge the fact that we don't have someone from Kashmir today. We couldn't, um, the way that we put this panel together. Uh, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a Kashmiri, and I don't um, often I don't speak about Kashmir unless there is a Kashmiri in the panel. But I do want to also recognize the fact that um, after the revocation of 370, um, Article 370 in by the Indian state, um, over eight million Kashmiris have been put under a unilateral um, irrevocable digital siege and internet shutdowns. And the most recent one happened with the passing of um, Gelani. And of course, we also see the unrelenting assault on journalists in Kashmir. And I think it's an important moment. Um, um, I cannot speak. Um, I, I often, this is something that I do as a principal. I don't speak about Kashmir unless there are Kashmiris in the panel because it's their voices have been silent. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to understand what's happening on the ground. I'm now going to open up. Um, please do send in your questions. We have about 45 minutes, and there's some um, interesting questions coming in. And I'm going to put it to the audio to the panelists. Um, some questions are very di uh, directed to some panelists, but also if others want to re respond to it, please do. Um, the first question uh, is about um, the question of uh, national security. I think this is from Mukesh Singh. I'm not going to read your entire uh, uh, thing, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to paraphrase that question. Mukesh Singh's question is about um, the Nepal open borders, but he also says, I'm sure you understand what I mean by terrorists, criminals uh, can use these lands. And I think this kind of goes to Mr. Kanak's question about the open border and the question of security. Uh, Kanak, can you talk to us about the the Nepal border? Also respond to Mukesh's, Mr. Mukesh Singh's question. Uh, also, if other panelists want to respond to the question about um, the question of security, national security versus borders, um, and I'll just, uh, I'll go on mute, but I'll let Kanak respond, and then anybody else wants to jump in, please jump in. Uh, I'm glad I can get to the point about the um, uh, India border, uh, which is about 1,800 kilometers long, and it is open. It is not porous. It is not regulated. It is open. Uh, there is some heartburn all around because of this, for sure. But my first proposition would be that if we are talking about, we cannot really talk about a borderless South Asia because the nation states are coagulated in place. So you can talk about the softening of the borders, making them porous. And you don't even have to have it open like the Nepali India border. But the Nepal India border stands like a beacon, something that is little understood by scholars, particularly in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, who talk about open borders or uh, lowered restrictions on the borders. They fail to look at the fact that next door is a sovereign nation state, uh, bar none, Nepal, uh, much smaller than the larger India and has maintained its sovereignty with a plum, despite the fact that it is open into India in, in its totality. So I would firstly propose that if we are thinking about borders as an aberration of any kind that at the very least need to be softened, then there is a need for South Asian scholars to study the Nepal-India borders, including the challenges it faces for now. Because it is, it is exemplary, because it is a naturally evolved border. It is not a Radcliffe or a Durand coming and, you know, one of the people was very unwell with a lot of diarrhea when he was making the lines. 
1947, uh, India, Pakistan. What is India and what is Pakistan today on the so called Western Front? However, Nepal in Nepal's border with India goes back to the evolved history uh, pre British times when the Hill Rajas all had uh, properties, uh, land holdings in the adjacent plains. And those when Nepal was lead as a nation state uh, by the ancestor of the last king uh, before Nepal became a republic, those borders continued. And then, of course, there was the Nepal-India war, uh, Nepal-British-India war of uh, 1814, 15, 16, which truncated Nepal's side. But the existing borders are still historically evolved. That is all I'll say about the history of this evolved border, why it, why it is different from all other borders of South Asia. Now, within Nepal, there is uh, a growing um, uh, sort of campaign to restrict the border, to close it, saying that this open border is actually a, a big bane on us. Regarding terrorism, what I would say is this. Yes, Nepal's border with India is meant for the citizens of the two countries and not for third country citizens to infiltrate into India because Nepal has the most open visa regime in Malaysia. Even today, other than Afghans, others may enter uh, these on arrivals and don't even need a visa. So, I uh, believe that the there has been misuse of the Nepal border, but not to such an extent that Nepal should itself promote the closure of this border. There are especially very tendentious and um, uh, items placed by Indian intelligence. Whenever things get a little jittery, they get a little jittery. They would like to say that terrorists come across the border from Nepal. Some would have missed it, but not to the extent that it is presented. So Nepalis in particular should not get carried away by this idea that terrorists are misusing this war to such an extent that Nepal should think of closer. I'll end by saying this much, that Nepal's middle class and upper classes in Kathmandu do not seem to realize the incredible prize that we have got. Easy passage because India is the largest entity in the subcontinent. To have the run of India, to go as tourists, to go for pilgrimages, not to have to bother about visas. The moment you start thinking of closed borders, that also goes out of the window. And uh, the friends that I have in India and in Bangladesh, who say, you mean you guys can just go as you please? And yes. And likewise, the other way, of course, Indians also can come into Nepal, but India being a larger place, there's more to make the point that we shouldn't rush and be part of somebody else's agenda to shut the border. However, there has to be regulation. There has to be more regulation than there is today. At least some information keeping, utilizing whatever uh, technologies are available without them being surveillance technologies. So I would just say that in conclusion, Nepal-India border is exemplary. It is open. It should remain open with certain provisos to make sure that uh, security interests of certain parties are uh, certainly uh, protected. Likewise, Nepal's economy and society is also protected. However, we should never forget that the demography of the plains of Nepal is the same as the adjacent demography on the other side. And the connectivity across borderlands, which everybody else is decrying, like Mali, communities on two sides. We're talking about Rajasthan and Sindh. We're talking about Punjab. In these, there's been a blockage there. In Nepal, take it as an exemplary uh, uh, situation, the cross-border communities remain in contact uh, and vibrantly so. Okay. Uh, should we move on to the next question? All right. Great. Uh, I'm going to actually go back to um, Basil Andrews' question about to all of the panelists about um, uh, climate change. He says he asks, 
Do you think that with the shared land within South Asia, with the climate crisis and shared vulnerabilities, um, like the cyclones, heat wave, uh, smog in Punjab, do away with borders, or is there more fissuring? Apart from the information sharing that is already in place via international agreements, um, the climate change obligations. Um, yeah, so I think I was wondering if we could go back to the question of um, climate change and other natural disasters. And as Kanak has already said, you know, what 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 standing army would you keep when the ocean swallows land? So I was wondering if panelists want to step in and then uh, take this question. Tamara, would you like to go? I am. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's it's a very it promises. You, one can be optimistic about sort of thinking that if anything, this is a call for more imaginative ideas of what it might mean, right? And this is historically true that we can look at environment as a driver of people moving, right? Whether that's famine or disease, you know, COVID is not the first epidemic that we have seen. Um, and really thinking about the Bay of Bengal Rim, as, you know, so many scholars and journalists have highlighted as probably the region that is most at risk from, um, at least from rising sea level, right? We can think about the most densely crowded um, sort of oceanic littoral in terms of the number of people who live along um, along the rim who are going to be vulnerable to sea level rise. And, it, you know, it, in some ways, I think we are already readjusting, right? We can look at, you know, migration from the Maldives into Sri Lanka, right, as the islands sink. Um, and I think, you know, it it calls for, at the very least, some sort of trans-regional Bay of Bengal idea for what um, hosting these people well might look like, right? We know that existing structures for managing refugee crises or people fleeing, whatever it is in the region, are inadequate. Um, we know that things are going to get worse, not better, right? Um, and I, I, I think there is a sense, right, that kind of ecological crisis forces us to come up with new forms of citizenship and activism and collective belonging, right, whether that's sort of wildfires up and down um, the north, um, the sort of Pacific coast or southern Europe, and in our case for our region, cyclones, rising sea levels, um, the way fish stocks are affected. So I, I, I think it's very urgent. I think. Um, Yeah, as Mr. Kanak has said, you know, we're not going to get rid of the nation state, right, immediately. So there's going to be a very urgent need for some sort of transnational idea for how to cope with this in, in the medium to long term. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Malni, would you like to uh, come in? Yeah, I want to briefly jump in and say, you know, in the in the... Bangladesh India borderlands, the specter of climate change, fuels the imagination of hordes of landless, hungry people uh, displaced by floods and land loss entering India. Now, the reality is completely different because if you look at the kind of humanitarian interventions that have happened in the field of disaster management, you know, the villages on the Bangladeshi side are actually light years ahead of the Indian side, not to mention that they have far better electricity and far better uh, resources. So we we work with very, very uh, misconceived notions when we think about climate change. Having said that, I think in the zones, especially in the Char lands or the riverine islands, that are much more prone to erosions and, you know, in the literal, literal zones where, which are prone to, uh, you know, inundation and flooding. I think there are innumerable possibilities to have a shared climate future, which is not about staging climate spectacles, which is not about sending troops and building these disaster shelters, Tamara, you know, you were mentioning. It's not about the construction of physical infrastructures all the time, but it's about having a very concerted response to 
shared ecologies and shared climate futures and that is where currently as as you were saying you know we we need to work together and we have to use this kind of you know digital resources that we have today to 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 have a far better uh you know mapping of those uh, fragile ecologies not to put up fences not to put up patrolling boats but precisely to help communities whose lives are sandwiched in those ecologies in 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 productive ways to have advanced meteorological information to to be prepared not just because we want to prevent people from crossing the border from one side to the other but because we really want to help and be a part of the shared landscape that people are living on uh, you know in these very fragile ecologies thank you Chita, can i get in yeah can i get in please do please do uh i just uh, i'd like to suggest that when we speak of the climate crisis it's mm-hmm. long past for us to say climate change um the himalaya which is mm-hmm. by so many countries of south asia and i would say the himalaya is shared by all of south asia it is like a clothes line on which south asia hangs um it is like a it is a barometer of the climate crisis one barometer is the rising oceans the other barometer is the receding snow line it is not the snow line is not only receding because of the climate crisis it is also receding because of, of what we call the brown cloud or black mm. carbon black carbon rises from pakistan sindh mm. from mm. lahore from delhi from the industries of the gangetic belt and rests on the snows of our commonly held himalaya and because of the the darker soot attracts more energy the snows melt very rapidly now this is a regional issue it is not a region issue of nepal or bhutan or himachal pradesh or uttarakhand or kashmir or uh, go further out to parts of pakistan afghanistan and even burma so what does one do about it you know i feel that things should begin at the level of scholarship and sadly i do not think there has been enough work by scholars who will challenge the nation state where it needs to be challenged uh because from there we will move on to activism people who will speak with each other despite the strictures of the nation state but mm. i feel that there is a timidity among the scholars because the nation state ultra populism is so strong that you want to work within the limits of your country and if at all you want to talk about other countries of south asia even for climate crisis you will speak mm. under the rubric of left let us say sark you will mm. become a south you will not become a south asian you will become an indian wanting to talk to a pakistani not mm. a karachi person speaking to a mumbai person mm. uh amish madhya would you like to come in on this question or should we but uh, i'll just add something to what malini had said about like inter country uh, let's say cooperation i believe that there are some things already in the works uh, if i remember correctly last year china had given an early warning of some uh, floods or landslides in across the border and then nepali uh, to nepali local authorities in one district here and uh, the population has shifted so i think there is obviously i'm not i'm not some sort of, i'm not being romantic and saying that oh, we can like you know come the the common consensus that we reached is that borders are here to stay and in fact they're going to become more tougher than you than earlier but perhaps it doesn't always require the thinking of borders there can be inter country let's say early warning systems it that you know surely i mean there is there is we don't get a lot of warning for these sort of things but there is enough let's say scientific evidence out there that you can have a little bit of let's say a time period in which let's say at least in the mountains right like for landslides or for flash floods things like that and i think it the other thing is also the way we look at let's say weather itself like you know like generally when you look at meteorological forecasts right and you're looking at it from country to country basis right and you look at it let's say i mean if i'm in nepal i'm looking at nepali weather but i don't look at it 
on the subcontinent as a whole or the region as a whole. And perhaps that is one way that you can shift how these things are perceived to look at whether not as a city specific or a place specific or a country specific thing, but a region specific thing. Because I mean, uh, I believe uh, this monsoon trough that's been here in the mountains for the past two weeks or something, now it's shifting west. So you're seeing more landslides in towards Himachal, towards Uttarakhand. So things like that will obviously affect each other. The, the only solution that we have is to have, a, let's say, some sort of a channel of communication. You know, this is more than, more than borders. I think it's about keeping communications open to have that sort of that's a system in place, a protocol in place that, all right, you can at least warn each other, even if you don't act on anything. And perhaps that's a way to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amish. Uh, Amish, I also have a question uh, that was sent to me on my Twitter DM for you. Less about borderlands, more about Nepal. Uh, can, I, can I put that question to you? Yeah, sure, sure. So this question comes, um, this question says, um, they're asking you if, for long, um, for long, India has often been seen as the friendly neighbor to Nepal, but your book, uh, your book uh, cl claims that 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 friendly relationship is now fast eroding. So they are asking if, can you point to us if ways in which India's imperialistic, let's put on the quote, imperialistic behavior. First, you think, do you think it's India's imperialistic behavior that's affected this, this change? What are the ways in which the Nepalis are thinking about their own relationship within the larger South Asia? So, two very big questions. So, please take them as, as you wish. <laughs> this is very different. All right. the we are so, the, so, the first question for the first question, I think India and Nepal relations, I think the, my, my personal belief is that the, the core of the issue is in the asymmetry with which each let's say country or center views the other right like i mean it's 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 there is always an asymmetry in big country small country little relations and beyond that also there's a there's a there's a sort of a let's say a larger thing about nepal insisting that okay there are certain terms of the existing bilateral treaty that are not favorable to it and india insisting that all right no we will continue with it so there are these larger, larger issues right and having said that, there is also a sense in Nepal, like the Nepali political sphere, that anti-Indian nationalism works, right? It, it helps, it helps basically put people in power, it helps people when they are not in power, and it is being used over, it has been evolved, sharpened over a period of time. And the 2015 constitution, the whole, let's say, the blockade after that, everything was, let's say, a culmination of all these things coming together. And the territorial dispute is also part of that. And where, where in India and Nepal, both are different. It's a territorial dispute. That's why, I mean, it is a dispute, right? Where both have different ideas about the territories. But having said that, I think Nepal's view of the subcontinent is limited in many ways by its obsess obsession with its two giant neighbors. You know, like in the sense that uh, I just read today that uh, I was speaking to someone and we uh, were just talking about how Nepal is now uh, going to export power to Bangladesh. And I mean, it's, it's a big thing, right? But you don't, you don't hear about it being talked about at the same level as, let's say, I mean, the current political discourse in Kathmandu is regarding the MCC treaty versus US. So it's the Nepali worldview has... It's India, then China, then the US and UK, all these countries. So it's never been the region as such. It, the region for Nepal has meant, in many ways, it's meant India. And India, in that sense also, it means the, the UP states of UP and Bihar. It's never meant, let's say, like one of the arguments I'd like to make is that we have India on the eastern borders and the western borders as well. And there the relations are equally, let's say, intricate, if not more so. I mean... While I was traveling in Kumao, I've met farmers who've come all the way from like middle of Nepal, you know, who leased out land in Kumao because in farmer, like the land owning people in Kumao have moved to the cities, right? Like, I mean, it's a common occurrence across the hills. No one wants to live in the hills anymore, you know, when, because it's more difficult to live in the hills. And similarly to the east, like we have Sikkim, we have the, the Darjeeling Hill tracks. We don't seem to, let's say, Enter in, they don't seem to enter into our conversations unless it has, uh, for example, the last time I remember we talked seriously about Sikkim in Nepal was when uh, this guy called Prashant Tamang won the Indian Idol. 
So that is when a lot of all all of Nepalese like basically they voted for him, and this is that sort of a thing, right? So and I think it's again, we have to in Nepal we have to sort of think beyond just the southern border of India to look at the region, and this is something that has I, it it is aspirational. It is something that is in the works. People have now started thinking about China. People have now, I mean, a lot of young people now go to the US or Australia to study. So there is a new sense of what the world means to Nepalis, right? It's like everything else, it is a work in progress. It will, I suppose, the real contours will be shaped in the years to come. But for now, it is that. That's my view. So. Um, we are coming uh, closer to the end time. So I have uh, a question for uh, Malni and Madiha, and then I will uh, ask, invite the panelists to make the concluding remarks. Uh, Malni, the question for you is about, what do you see um, as the next, in the next few months, what do you see happening to the NRCCAA uh, play, playing out, especially to these borderlands communities? Um, and what ways, uh, what ways do you see uh, these communities crafting their own effective resistance? Uh, if we are speaking about communities in Assam, I think there are reasons to be extremely concerned uh, in the ways in which, uh, you know, the state is trying to map out uh, so-called uh, legal Indian citizens uh, away from uh, unauthorized Bangladeshis. And the logic of paperwork that the state is following is extremely disorderly. At the same time, in Assam, you have spaces of resistance like mere poetry, alternative forms of expression. Now, you also have other kinds of political mobilization uh, that, like the state, is using uh, religion. As, as a way of resistance. Uh, I don't think any of these vantage points help the cause of people uh, who do not have documentation or who have documentation that are uh, under suspicion. Uh, I am concerned about what this combination of the um, NRC is going to do. CAA, it was very clear if we are talking about, uh, you know, a pan-India uh, uh, situation, the CAA had a very clear intention. The CAA was promoted in a way to muscle flex, to, to, to redraw the fault lines of religion and to communicate to a large population of uh, Indian Muslim citizens that India is not their home. And this was implemented, as we all know, in the most disastrous uh, ways with, with uh, violent uh, means. And this was the message that the CA intended to convey, and it did so very briefly. Uh, I do not see, uh, you know, uh, you had a very strong resistance uh, to the CA and the NRC, and Suchitra was, was I think, in, in Delhi in JNU at that point of time. And I remember her tweeting. I, I, I was not there, unfortunately, but I do remember uh, Suchitra tweeting from various protest sites in uh, Delhi. And those, those moments of hope, unfortunately, got uh, pushed away by the pandemic and, uh, you know, other things. So, yeah. Um, Malni was also there the night of the JNU violence. I was outside the campus. We heard the violence was happening. Hmm. And just as we were walking towards the JNU, the main street that connects, um, right. they, were sh they shut down all of the lights, like a kilometer leading in, all the lights had been shut down. So it's interesting to figure out who made the lights, you know, in the heart of yeah. the city shut down. And as we were walking in, we were one of the few people walking towards the street, towards because the violence had started, the media hadn't arrived. And you saw the police out um, in full riot gear and the police were saying things like, this is the Kurukshetra. And I wasn't, we were all a little surprised because we were wondering, because they were seeing themselves as the, as the good people and they felt that the students were the ones who were um, creating trouble. 
But again, there's a conversation for another day. Uh, Malika, the question for you uh, is, just even as the US has withdrawn uh, from Afghanistan, there was a drone strike that killed families in, in, in Kabul. While US might have retreated for all purposes, for the visual narrative purposes, the war on terror is still there. First question, how does one continue to write and discuss the questions of drone work, warfare, especially the immense violence that's wrought on these communities? How does then one use the scholarship as a way of not only questioning the US empire, but also holding this empire accountable? Thank you. Um, yeah, those are great questions. You know, I think, um, again, I think that the part of the thing is for us to understand that empire uh, is not necessarily equivalent to the direct actions of the U.S. state. I think we have a tendency to kind of conflate empire and state. And so anything that U.S. state is not directly doing, we don't necessarily understand as sort of being implicated in, 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 in imperial politics. So I think that's one of the things to remember because um, with Afghanistan, of course, um, Yes, it's being touted as a withdrawal, but the United States has been talking about using drone warfare well into the future uh, and continuing to use drone warfare into the future in Afghanistan and is looking for uh, drone bases again in Pakistan uh, to, uh, to use to, to surveil and bomb the region as it deems necessary. Um, so that's one form of... Uh, imperial kind of actions that will happen but the other form is that you know this strike apparently took place with the collaboration of the taliban so we are seeing new kinds of alliances um taking shape uh with local kind of collaborators in the imperial project and i think it's going to be very important to track those and 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 not to sort of separate out again into status analyses um I think Kanak has mentioned this as well, and others have mentioned it as well. You know, it's important to kind of move beyond status analyses and be able to track these networks um, all the way down. Um, and we may not always have documentation to do that. Uh, we have to figure out other ways. We have to learn to believe the communities that we are a part of, I think, or the, the communities that we work with. I think one of the things that tends to happen is that these things remain anecdotes, quote unquote anecdotes, until such time as some sort of official documentation or official something or other gets leaked. And at that point, it becomes a big story. And, I, and that's going to be harder um, that's that's something that's going to be harder once the war on terror supposedly winds down and it gets re, you know dispersed among local collaborators. It's going to be much more difficult to get you know that kind of documentation, say from the Pakistani state or from Afghanistan, etc. Um, so I think that's really important. I think as as people committed to justice, we just have to get a sense of enlarging our sense of empire, enlarging our sense of. Um, what counts as evidence and documentation uh, of the actions of the state, and uh, you know, to be able to bring, to to be able to create transnational solidarities, to be able to create solidarities across Pakistan and Afghanistan that are not reliant on state politics, um, that are about sort of just visions and open borders um, across the way. I mean, that question earlier about open borders and securitization, I partly didn't answer because for me, it's very difficult to separate out the question of terrorism from the state, right? The states are heavily involved in constructing this notion, both ideologically, but also materially of what it means to, you know, what is it, a, 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 a terrorist? Um, and Afghanistan and Pakistan, insofar as, you know, there are bitter rivalries about the, across uh, in terms of the border, where the border is and where it ought to be, etc. They were also collaborating um, in, in Durham on the Afghanistan side. There was a massive U.S. military base. Um, and in the base, there was a Khyber border coordination center where the Pakistanis, the Afghans, and the Americans met together to watch drone visual feeds um, and work together to you know, conduct these bombardments and uh, exchange information. Um, so I, I think we have to, uh, just be very careful about being able to track these local collaborators in the long term. Um, I think one of the difficulties is that 
the Western media for sure has been very um, attuned to Western stories, which is to say stories of white characters, stories of the military, Western military. Um, and I think it's going to be up to places like Himal and other kinds of outlets that are differently oriented to kind of be able to attract. I don't have any hope from <laughs> Western media outlets. <laughs> so that's all I'll say about that. Thank you, Maria. Um, yes, we are coming to the, the last bits of this, conversa this conversation. So um, I'm going to invite all of our panelists to make their concluding remarks, and then we will bring this conversation to an end. Uh, Tamara, would you like to go ahead? I guess maybe one thing to say specifically from the perspective of the sea, so that's not considering sort of borders as a, they're experienced over land, driving in or walking or um, coming from the air, is also thinking about border making and claim making um, as sort of ongoing debates, right, that are only growing and thinking of, um, and thinking in particular of debates you know, maybe there is something specific about the sea where it's harder to draw a line. Uh, back to uh, Mr. Kanak's analysis of, of lines for us. But I'm thinking of new claims that both India and Sri Lanka are making around, say, oil deposits or minerals at sea. Thinking again back to this question of ter terrorism and militarization of the way that the sea border between Sri Lanka and India became militarized in the process of the civil war. So the concern was that fishers, say those who were hunting for sea cucumbers, would also be smuggling arms or ammunition or the military. And years and years after the civil war, this is still a deeply militarized zone, right? So the argument that it's about arms smuggling doesn't really hold anymore. This is mostly about government budgets and votes and needing to um, maintain the military state in a sense, right? Um, but maybe thinking that Claim making is ongoing and borders continue to be made and states continue to lay claim can also then show us that borders are fallible, right? And we know what it is like to live in a world where um, these are spaces that haven't always been militarized or had these regimes around them. Um, so again, you know, as, as Malini says, returning to communities, to um, different patterns of belonging, um, that are non-state centric might actually provide maps that are useful rather than sort of imperialist constructions. Thank you, Tamara. Mali? I want to briefly return to Sam's uh, observations on chat and also that of a few others. I think there's somebody uh, under the label of indigenous Assamese, if I'm right. And these these are such important uh, you know, commentaries that all of you have brought to the discussion. And I was uh, reading through the rich insights that you've actually provided us. You're absolutely correct. You know, the whole question of uh, rethinking the borders is a question of not thinking about it from the centers. Panakji was saying the moment I want to come back to Himal's map. And, you know, when you look at... Uh, the borders, as Kanakji was saying, you see lines on the ground and then you start seeing capital cities. And the kind of inverted map that Himal aspired for South Asia begins with exactly Sam and all of you who've participated uh, in today's discussion have brought to the foreground in terms of shared ethnicities, shared cultures that the border artificially divides. And it's actually these communities not just the you know village elders and others, but also youth who cross borders to maintain, as you say, maintain ties with their cousins or have cross-border friendship. These these are the kind of communities we need to work with. And might I say that we already have an example in South Asia about these kind of associations, and we need to strengthen them. Here I'm thinking about the border hearts that have been set up between Bangladesh and Meghalaya, where traders from both sides can come and trade up to, uh, you know, 50 US dollars a day. I mean, these are exactly the kind of micro 
corporations that need to amplify. And these are exactly the models that we need to work with, models that will address questions of shared ethnicities, cultures, and livelihoods. Thank you, Mani. Uh, Amish? So, Jitra, I think one of the things that we've pretty much agreed on is that, yeah, like borders are here to stay, they will become stricter, we will see more, let's say, exclusivist control over who, like, who's the passage of movement. But at the same time, I think it is also imperative that we, we give more of a voice to those who are living in the borderlands to bring out their stories, to tell their narratives in, and bring it out to the center in some way or the other to show that the border is not just some, uh, as Malini said, land as political territory, you know, like it is not just this political space that you're fighting for. It's also more than that. It's, 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 a, it's a sh more beyond shared heritage, shared cultures. It's also people, right? And people who have been living there for generations, who may have moved there newly, but at the same time, it's, it's about thinking about the border spaces more as more than just, you know, the center's perspective that, all right, this, this, this territory exists and this is a part of our country and that's it. You know, you don't, and that's where the thinking pretty much stops. And I think we have to go beyond that. We have to sort of like look at what are the historical processes that made this place into a borderland in the first place, you know, and because there, Every, every place has a story and we have to dig that out. We have to sort of like figure out how do you emphasize and elevate those stories so that the center's narrative does not always dominate, right? So I think that, one, that would be it. So. Thank you, Amish. Uh, Madiha and then Mr. Kanak. Yes, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say... <laughs> I think you're right, Amish, that probably borders are here to stay, but I would like to imagine otherwise, and I would like to hope for otherwise. Um, I guess what I'd like to say in closing is that, you know, borders are obviously materially constituted, but they're also ideologically constituted, and they're constituted also in language. And so I guess this is partly a, a comment on both on scholarship, but also on, on public writing, which is that I think part of the way that I think we are captured by borders is that we don't have the language really uh, or we haven't really figured out the language to speak uh, in transnational terms in the terms of open borders um, to imagine otherwise really and to have the language for that imagination so we still speak in terms of civilians and terrorists and uh, you know border zones and all kinds of uh, you know language uh, particularly military language, I think we're so inundated with it. You know, this idea of civilian and terrorist is really, it's a militaristic kind of term and co concept and that we use it um, in popular, in public writing and in all kinds of ways. Um, and so I think it's important for us to be able to think about, to really think about how can we reconstitute our language when we are talking about these um, issues and come up with different terms and ideologies and concepts and phrases to um, kind of give voice to a different kind of imagination. Mr. Kenneth? I was looking for this. When I suddenly find it is. So I had come towards the conclusion by reading this short paragraph describing the reason for creating that right side up map. This map of South Asia, and by the way, South Asia in Himal style book, is spelled as one word, which is also an attempt to break the borders, South Asia. This map of South Asia may seem upside down to some, but that is because we are programmed of page. This rotation is an attempt by the editors of Himal to reconceptualize regionalism in a way that focus that the focus is on the people rather than the nation states. This requires nothing less than turning our minds downside up. So that is what I think we in editors put together a decade ago. Um, now to come to the present, uh, I have no problem with the call of South Asianists. I'm 
I would call myself one too, uh, for open borders and free visas, because that is indeed what the history and the culture of South Asia demands. But since it's difficult to get there right away, unless there is some kind of an incredible crisis in South Asia and the breakaways fall where they will, and nobody wants that type of revolution. So we want to, we've got to work with what we've got. And uh, so I would say, let us work not towards open borders for now, but let us keep, keep the goal at porous borders, borders where visa regimes are easier to achieve and uh, the borders are not manned with um, guns and guard dogs and halogen lamps and uh, concertina wires. So that is the goal to set for ourselves. How to get there? As I have myself also said more than once over this conversation, it's getting harder. But uh, the worst of times is the is when you plan for the best of times. The worst of times, uh, I'm glad we talked about NRC and uh, CAA and what's happening in India. Uh, because India was always considered the democratic center of South Asia. It is geographically in the center. It borders on all the countries other than Afghanistan who don't border each other. Uh, in every way, it was, and it was democratic. Uh, it is less and less so now. And that in itself creates a, a problem for thinking out a porous border South Asia. Because the RSS BJP uh, rule is for increasingly strident nationalism which takes pride in the borders that was received after 1947. And if they do talk about South Asia, they talk of it in terms of a Akhanda Bharat, almost a super Marxist kind of a idea of South Asia, which is not the South Asia we would want. My own idea of a South Asia is one that is more, ever more localized. You can call it the Gandhian South Asia, even though the term of further extent by the time Gandhi was assassinated, but more south, more devolution, more localized. That is the South Asia of the future. But as I said once earlier, the scholarship has failed South Asia and South Asians thus far. We are still talking in bits and pieces, and there is no real ontology or a conceptualization of South Asia, which will help provide the oomph, the energy to the activists who need to come in and we need to be able to say South Asia, the idea is a social justice project, as I like to say. And that is why we need to have people working more on how to conceptualize South Asia, where the borders are made less important than they are today, but once borders that will not really go away. So I will leave, I'll end by only making this point that South Asia ideally is a place of penumbras from the Arakan coast to Balochistan and from Tibet to the southernmost tip of Sri Lanka. It is actually uh, penumbras of different cultures, societies, mixing and melding all the way from one to the other. And you, one might not recognize the other corner, but it's all mixed in there. That is the kind of borders, if at all the term is to be used, we need for South Asia. And for that, we need to get the scholars to start thinking South Asia. Only then will we tackle these borders that we have with us. Uh, Mr. Kanak, thank you so much. Um, we're in the end of the conversation, but I just want to make some closing remarks. First, uh, thank you to the team at Himal, especially the editors and everybody who came together to make it. Um, I was just deeply touched by the immense love, the, this, the, just the love, the generosity, um, also the professionalism and, and, and the ways in which all the work that was done, that was done collaboratively. Uh, so thank you all of you for bringing this conversation together. Um, before I end, I just want to quickly go back and just 
um, for some of you who joined later, uh, please do visit, um, please do learn more about the scholars and writers that you heard today. Uh, I was introduced to Tamara's work through this panel and I've just been completely blown away with the way she thinks about labor histories and information. Please do. Um, we have two authors here. We have two new books. Amish's book came last year, which is called All Roads uh, Lead North. So please get that book. And Mali's book, um, Jungle Passport is also here. I've bought both of these books. They're, they're brilliant. Uh, they teach you so much. So please do get those books as well. Of course, Madiha's work itself is um, this film, it's essays, it's, it's rich. There's also the Tanqeed archive that I keep going back to often to read. So if you haven't, please do look it up. And of course, Mr. Kanak, I, your body of work is too large. And, and the people that and the work that you've inspired is, is wonderful. But again, Himal being um, one of your greatest ways of getting us all together, please to support organizations like Himal. And I think that's absolutely important. And finally, for those of you who haven't, um, please do uh, find times and ways to learn more about what's happening in Kashmir, especially in relationship to the silencing of journalists the ways in which laws that like UAPA and PSA have been weaponized to not only silence, but brutally crush the vibrant scene. On that note, I'm going to conclude today. And again, a huge thanks to the team at Himal. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.